Hello everybody, my name is Lukasz Pławski and I'm from Warsaw University. Uh, today I would like to briefly present the work that is described in one of the papers. Uh, the, overall, the, the overall idea of the concept is, I would say, quite simple, but uh, in order to understand the simple idea, we have to introduce a lot of different definitions and with this I will start this presentation with, um, with an attempt to um, explain these uh, definitions. Uh, and the title of the paper is Improvement of Design Pattern, Design Anti-Pattern Detection with Use of Spatial Temporal Rules in the Software Development Process. So the, uh, the agenda for my presentation is that I will first <coughs> <clears throat> I will first try to explain how we understand the structure of the software, what is our model there, how we represent the evolution of the software, which is the process of the development of the software by the developers. Then I will uh, shortly introduce what is a design anti-pattern, and further on I will explain what are the spatial temporal relations and spatial temporal rules in the software development process. And once we, we understand these notions, then I can try to present the, uh, the, the proposed framework and uh, the results that are described in the, in the paper. Uh, okay, so let's start with a software structure. If we take a look at the source code of a software structure exemplified on the left side, so we can see some elements of it uh, that are connected one uh, to the other by specific dependencies, by specific relations uh, and that are expressed by some very specific constructs of the programming language. For example, if you take a look uh, at the uh, definition of a Java class B that extends D, we know that there are two concepts specifically in this line, expressed in this line of the source code. And this line tells us that there is a class B that extends class D. And we can draw similar uh, conclusions from this piece of source code and identify other elements of the structure of the source code and other uh, relations between them and express them uh, in the form of a graph that is uh, roughly depicted um, on the right side of the slide. Uh, that's the idea. And the general uh, definition of this graph is that the nodes of it are called source code entities. And the relations that can be derived only from the, um, from the, from the source code of the program are given on the right side. So the entities that we consider in this research are source code files. We are only talking about programs written in Java. So we have files, packages, classes, methods, and fields. These are the entities. And uh, the relations between these entities uh, are listed on the right side. There is a containment relation as Containment simply means that the, the source code of one entity is uh, included entirely in the source code of the outer entity. Parameter means that uh, a method has a parameter uh, of a certain type, and therefore this method with this type is, is connected by an edge uh, with like a parameter. The relation extend is a relation between two classes, and it means that uh, one class extends the other. Implement is a similar relation between class and interface. This might be specific to Java. The correlation is between uh, methods. It means that one method invokes another method within its source code. Refer is a, a relation between a method and a field, uh, which means that within the body of the uh, method, a specific field is referenced, uh, and uh, 
type is a met is a uh, relation between either field or uh, method to a type meaning that the type of this field or the return time of this method is uh, is the other type that is referred by these relations. And the last uh, relation that we use in this research is variable. It means that it, it can connect a method uh, with, uh, with a type, and it means that within the body of this method, uh, a variable of this specific type is instantiate. Uh, so this, this idea here can model <coughs> the structure of the source code. As you can see, that, that's a huge simplification of the actual source code. And more, moreover, it's a huge simplification of the actual program behavior, like because the, we cannot tell how the program will behave only by looking at its source code. And yet, even with these simplifications, we have experimentally proved that uh, uh, we can quite efficiently uh, use this graph presentation to uh, mine specific knowledge from the software structure and, as we later see, also software evolution. We also add an additional elements to this model, uh, which are software metrics. Uh, software metric is a well-known and say well-established concept, uh, and we can define it in this model. We can define it in such a way that every metric is a function from the set of uh, entities, real numbers, and every such function measures some property, well, degree uh, to which a certain entity has some property. Usually, probably the easiest way of thinking it is to um, to say that uh, every single metric actually measures the complexity of the code uh, of the respective software entity, but also other properties can be measured by by this method. An example of uh, of a few easy to understand uh, software metrics are given on the right. We have number of methods. So if, a, if, we have, if we have a class in this, and we count the methods defined in the uh, source code of the class, this is the value of the uh, of the metric. Number of fields again for a class. This is the number of fields defined in the body of the class. Lines of code. This is a, a, a metric that measures how many lines of code it takes to define a certain source code entity. Uh, there is a convention in which the, the, um, the formatting of the source code is normalized, so this metric is invariant to comments, empty lines, etc. Uh, we have n path complexity and cyclometric complexity, which uh, quite differently express the complexity uh, of the body block. So this two metrics apply to every entity that contain uh, a body block. And uh, we also use eight other uh, metrics that are described in the, in the paper with references to the original uh, publications that introduced them. So if you want to know the details, please uh, uh, look it up in the, in the paper. But the question is, how can we embody the um, software metrics in our graph model? And the answer is that we do it by putting the values of specific metrics uh, and then additional labels of the, of the nodes of this graph. As we have said, the metrics is function defined on a set of entities, and therefore the, this kind of a vector with the values of specific metrics can be assigned to each node as its label. <clears throat> Therefore, the structure of the source code at a given point in time uh, in our research will be treated as a edge labeled, vertex labeled multigraph. And the convention uh, that we use uh, is depicted on the left side. Uh, this software snapshot, that's the name of the structure, has entities. These are 
uh, vertices because dependencies, these are labeled edges. <coughs> and it has additional vertex labeling provided by the vector of values of software metrics. And this is our core model of the structure of the software that we used uh, in the research. Right? Moving on. The software is being developed. That means that developers, well, uh, one by one or together, modify the source code of a metric. And in this research, we assume that we only look at the main develop development branch. It means that we have a linearly ordered, in fact, time ordered uh, set of modifications to the source code with all these modifications commits and each commit has some properties like revision which is a unique identifier of the, of the commit date authors short text message and also the you know, set of modifications done to the source code files and what is important commits are uh, atomic uh, like transactions to the uh, to the current state of the source code, uh, and therefore a software revolution. Uh, and as we can uh, translate the source at each revision, we can translate the source code uh, of the software into this graph representation. In in, in each individual uh, software snapshot, we will treat the evolution of the uh, software as a sequence of uh, multigraphs defined in, in a way presented in previous slides. This is our model of the of the software evolution. Uh, now introducing uh, another uh, concept with, which is uh, uh, design anti-pattern. Design anti-pattern is a commonly used, frequently used best solution for typical uh, problems in software design. Uh, in some research, they are also mixed with another notion of uh, code smell. Um, so if you take a look at, at, at the source code, uh, you can, you can uh, say, as an expert, you can say that this is the best solution, uh, I don't know, for, a, for an object-oriented design of a software. And as we uh, uh, and uh, a certain area of the uh, of the source source code usually constitutes such an uh, instance of a design anti pattern, and a few examples of such uh, anti patterns broadly described in the literature is Swiss Army knife, which simplifying a lot is a class with too much responsibility. Yo yo. Uh, is a functionality of scattered over extensive inheritance structure of, of uh, few classes. Blob is a complex class that takes control of behavior of other classes with super dependency in a situation in two, when two classes in different packages are mutually uh, dependent one on another. Uh, we can probably uh, observe these definitions are quite frequently informal and vague. Therefore, the the problem of anti-pattern detection is, I would argue, one of the uh, emerging topics in the in the area of mining software repositories, and we can define it as finding all the best structures in the source code that. Uh, uh, actually constitute specific instances of anti-patterns. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, publications available on the topic. I just gave you a few some examples of, of a systematic review uh, on the matter. And uh, clearly, as we as the goal of this task is to detect certain structures in the, in the source code that are uh, anti-patterns and we can represent the source code as a as a graph uh, then we can translate this problem in finding certain um, subgraphs the large graph 
in the large graph such that the subgraphs are actual instances of all anti patterns. And in general, it can be an uh, expensive uh, task, uh, but uh, some, some effective heuristics exist. <clears throat> so, this is the idea of how, how we can treat in this model design anti pattern detection. And conceptually, we can think of it in such a way that if we have a subgraph and we have some definition, some description of uh, of the properties of a graph that can tell if this specific subgraph is an anti pattern or not. Uh, we'll call this, we'll call this uh, such a description a detector of the anti pattern, and uh, clearly, uh, given any graph representation of the source code, we can tell all the instances of the anti patterns uh, in the source code. And uh, uh, in this paper, we have uh, taken uh, existing descriptions of a few popular anti patterns and we have validated them against software with uh, reference tagging, which means meaning that a, a software engineer expert appointed certain um, anti patterns in the source code. And we, we tried this uh, graph theoretic approach presented in the previous slide, and the average precision and recall of the results is, is given on the right side of the slide. And I, I might say that it's comparable to existing state of the art uh, methods uh, for anti pattern detection. Uh, okay, so this, this was a static method of detecting anti patterns in the, in the, in the source code. And now we try to enhance it with the concept of spatial uh, temporal rules. Uh, if we take two graphs in, in the software snapshot, we can tell how close or how remote they are. And we'll say that if they are connected by a short path, then we'll say they are close. And, they, and they, if they are connected by a long path or such a path does not exist, then we'll say they are remote. Uh, this should reflect the situation in the source code where two areas of the source code are dependent one on another by some programming language uh, construct, closeness, or they are not connected by such a programming language uh, uh, construct in the case of uh, remoteness relation. Uh, the definition of closeness remoteness is uh, in such a way that we can define uh, this relation between two graphs, even if they do not uh, appear in one revision together, it is sufficient that the, there is a revision in which the nodes that constitute both subgraphs uh, are present all together. And with in, in all, each, all such each such uh, revision, we can compute this the length of this path and therefore say if the if the subgraphs are close or remote. All right, now another concept uh, which will which will be used is related to a temporal uh, relation. If we have a source code and this code, a certain structure is introduced in, in the source code, we may expect that it will stay there uh, for some time. Uh, well, usually we can expect that it will stay there for a long time. So we have defined a concept of a life, a life span. Life span is a set of all revisions in which a certain subgraph can be observed. So if you talk about, if you think about subgraph as a anti pattern, <coughs> we also have the lifespan in a set of all revisions in which this specific instance of anti pattern is observed. And we can, uh, as the revisions are linearly ordered, we can uh, divide each lifespan into uh, maximum uh, intervals, and these intervals are uh, will be called occurrences. And if we talk about intervals, now we move to the Allen's interval algebra. Uh, Allen, in his original work, this this picture on the right is actually from the original work defined 13 uh, relations between uh, intervals that define 
relations between them. If you take a look at the first row from this picture, the X interval is before Y interval, uh, and the inverse relation is after, so we can say that Y interval is after X interval, and all other cases of temporal relations uh, between intervals are depicted in the uh, other uh, rows of this, of this picture. So we will use Allen's relations to express temporal relations between uh, currencies of uh, design anti-patterns in the software evolution. And if you combine the concept of a spatial relation defined previously and the temporal relation defined by an Allen's uh, algebra operator, uh, we have a uh, spatial temporal relation between two occurrences of pattern instances, and this spatial temporal relation is a core concept uh, in the proposed framework. So, if you, if you have two occurrences of some two close on my patterns, and these occurrences, these intervals are in A Allen's relation, we will say that they are in A closeness relation, um, A closeness spatial temporal relations, and duality to that, if they're remote, we'll say that they're in A remoteness spatial temporal relation. If you take a the, uh, look at the example on the right side of the slide, and, uh, uh, you can see that the pattern instance observed in the last revision is in before closeness spatial relation to the uh, instance present in the first relation. So the core idea uh, that I would like to now shortly and um, I will skip this uh, to explain is that we, the, the idea is that we take all the occurrences of the uh, of the anti patterns in the entire evolution and we translate them into a decision table in such a way that every single occurrence corresponds to a single row in this decision table and each uh, Conditional attribute in this decision table uh, is uh, parameterized by three parameters. This is a uh, type of Allen's algebra operator, closeness or remoteness, and the type of uh, anti patterns. As, and as you can see in this, uh, uh, in this uh, example here, uh, for the first example column, the number x is the number of occurrences of anti-patterns of type t, t is the parameter of the column, that are in a close relationships to, uh, to O. so the, the, the occurrence that defines this row in the decision table. So this is the, the, the concept of how the decision table is constructed. You can probably look up more details in the paper, and as we have a decision table, we can uh, use it to create classification rules, and we all these rules, we will use these rules to improve the detection of design of anti-patterns, and these rules will be called uh, spatial temporal rules. So we extend our framework of detection of the anti-patterns in such a way that first we check if the graph matches the definition, the, the, the purely graph theoretical definition of the uh, of the anti-pattern. If it doesn't, then it's clearly not an anti-pattern, but if it does, then we check what is the classification of this occurrence uh, done by the spatial temporal rules uh, that I was trying to uh, explain just before. And only if these rules also classified as an instance of anti-patterns, then we, we decide that it is uh, anti-pattern. Clearly, such uh, such additional uh, spatial temporal condition can reduce the number of false positives, but it can increase the number of false negatives. So the, this framework does not necessarily improve the uh, detection quality, but we have experimentally validated that in most cases uh, the results do not change. And the table on the right shows all the cases where actually the value was different. In, on, only in two cases, uh, the quality of the diction uh, deteriorated. In all other cases, it was better. And the average 
uh, improvement uh, in terms of F1 measure was 4%. So adding this additional knowledge about spatial temporal relations in the software actually allow us to uh, improve the uh, detection quality of instance of anti patterns in the source code. And as I'm running out of time, uh, I would like to thank you and ask if you have any questions. I would like to ask about um, the complexity of your uh, model. What do you think is, uh, uh, did, did you uh, implement this uh, idea of uh, anti pattern recognitions in? In practice, or this is a kind of uh, theoretical model? Yes, uh, one of the slides defines the set of uh, data gathered from uh, open source software uh, that were used to validate it and was implemented. Uh, I don't know what is the theoretical complexity of it, uh, but uh, in some in my some other work. Uh, you can uh, read about a lot of heuristic uh, improvements that actually reduce the space of computation. So even if the theoretical complexity is very large, we can efficiently uh, reduce it to, to, to a very tiny subset of this graph, and therefore this, this method is well, practically efficient. Okay. Nice. Okay, because of the time, I would like to... Uh move this discussions for later and uh, I thank you very much Lukas. Thank you. Uh,